So you've heard two approaches where we go from patients to a diagnosis and then probably we understand what's uh, going on in a taxis. Uh, now, we're taking a completely different approach. We're starting from a biology, from a basic understanding of how genes and molecules work in our cells, and uh, we go up to try and understand how this is then dysfunctional in uh, ataxias and in other diseases. Um, so when I, uh, I, I, the title of the talk says hereditary ataxia, but I will focus on a specific um, cause of hereditary ataxia, which is the uh, polyglutamine ataxias that are due to an expansion uh, in a number of affected genes that uh, are, uh, cause a stretch of a particular amino acid called glutamine in the protein to be dysfunctional. And uh, many of them are spinocerebellar ataxias, but also polyglutamine diseases can include other diseases like Huntington and uh, spinal and bulbar muscular atrophy. In particular, in my laboratory, we focus on this disease called DRPLA, that uh, is caused by a mutation in atrophin 1. So the first thing that I need to approach is, does it actually make sense to model ataxias in animals? Uh, and you will see we use many animals. And uh, the, the, the reason that my reasoning in this is that um, if you were to take a young engineer who had just come out of school and you put it in, form, in front of a Formula One car to actually understand how it works and make it perform. We are all Formula One cars in evolution, human beings. But the young engineer will not understand how it works because it is too complex. So um, then you have to use a model that the engineer knows well that is simpler where you can learn rules that then can be applied to understanding of a Formula One car. Now the problem is to try and find the right models and the, 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 the reason why I think animals are good models of ataxias is because they are evolutionary related. So models could be of two types. They could be copycat models. For instance, a radio controlled car. It's made by humans to model something that a Formula One car, that is to go on wheels. Um, but effectively it works completely different. So the young engineer will not be able to understand how the Formula One car from a radio control car. But my PhD student, who is French, uh, pointed out to me that uh, the French young engineers start to learn how cars work from uh, Citroën de Savoie, because apparently it has the simplest engine on the planet. And then once you understand how that engine works, uh, then you can extract rules that you can apply to the Formula One car. Perhaps not directly, perhaps you have to understand how the Fiat 500 works, and perhaps then the, the Volkswagen Golf works. And then once you have all these things in common, then you can go and make a Formula One car better. But that is also another corollary in this. Not a single model would be the model. You will need many models because all models are different and they do better some things and worse other things. So what is the approach that we're taking in my laboratory? We're really using a variety of models. We're using mice, we're using cells and culture, and we're using these other organisms that is a fruit fly. And the idea is that by integrating the knowledge of these three models, and really these arrows go in all possible direction, we're learning from uh, every single model, then perhaps we think that one day we'll be able to translate uh, some of our knowledge uh, into, um, for the help of the patients. So you may be more familiar perhaps because there is there's, there's a lot more known about how you use mice in a laboratory or how you use cells and culture, but I wanted to uh, discuss in particular the use of uh, this uh, fruit fly organism. Why do we use it? Well, first of all, because it's fast, it's cheap to maintain in the laboratories, and it is very well known. It's been studied for over 100 years, and we know a lot of its genetics, uh, development, neurobiology. This is the nervous system of a fruit fly, this is the brain, and this is the spinal cord. And by no means has been my idea to use the fruit fly as a model for um, human disease. Um, this is, uh, is well known that 70% of the genes we've got uh, uh, in our body are conserved in flies and you can mutate them and try to understand how they work in flies and then translate that knowledge to humans or you can also make humanized models of disease um, carrying the human mutation. So 
then, as I said, we're not the only ones using this model. There are models for spinal cerebellar ataxia 1, 2, and 3 that are already been put out there and uh, giving us valuable information about uh, the mechanisms involved in ataxia. So then, uh, to give more, go, go into more specifically our work, um, we uh, started uh, trying to model, to make a humanized D model for DRPLA. And the first thing that we made sure it was that there was a good evolutionary conservation between the genes that we have in mammals and in obviously humans and all other mammals and the gene that's present in Drosophila. Often there is only one gene in Drosophila, there is more than one gene in mammals. This is because it happens in the evolution. But the important point is that when you go to the protein level, you have two separate proteins in flies and two separate proteins in mammals, and they correspond in terms of their function. So evolution was on our side. So we made these models and uh, we studied them. We tried to understand what was going wrong in the nervous system of these flies, and we hit on a process and a very basic process in the cell. Now, you know that, um, uh, so, in, in a way, this is also another interesting lesson from evolution. Now, autophagy is a process that we have basically in all our cells. It comes from a Greek word for self-digestion. Now, in evolution, uh, this happened to be uh, evolved in a very basic organism like yeast, because if you haven't got nutrients and you're starving, what yeast does is just it digests part of itself to make new things that may be helpful to go through the hardship. Now, in our nervous system, we don't really starve. So this process was not useful for starvation, but because it involves the degradation of something inside the cell and the recycling of this something, it was a good way to keep control of the insults and the rubbish we all produce in our cells. And in neurons that live as long as we do, we produce a lot of rubbish over the course of our years, and we have to dispose of it. But not only dispose, we have to recycle it. It's a little bit like we do in all our society. Um, we discard old plastic bottles, and then we recycle them. We melt the plastic, and we recycle with that plastic and make new things from you know, um, other plastic bottles to completely different objects. That's exactly how it works in the cell. And uh, we found out that this process was severely disrupted in uh, our DRPLA flies. And this is a scientific, um, you know, I'm not going into the scientific detail of this slide, but you have to see that these are all markers that we have used for this process in the flies. Now, we, as, as I said, we use a multimodal approach, and then we've taken mice that have DRPLA, that have the, the humanized mice uh, that model DRPLA, and we found that all these markers, all the alterations that we had found in the fruit flies were also present in the model for the mice. So we could essentially come up with the uh, conclusion that th this process of rubbish recycling inside our cells is actually broken in DRPLA. Um, and uh, I do have to say that this is a very basic process that will probably be involved in many more diseases than the RPLA. Um, so uh, we also try to understand not only that the process was broken, but actually what was causing this to be broken. And what was causing to be broken was that we found out that there was in specifically one a gene that was, uh, whose expression was reduced in DRPLA. It was reduced in the DRPLA flies, and uh, when we looked in the mice, uh, all the four <coughs> genes that are called FAT, th there's a reason why it's called FAT, but it's not important, all the different FAT genes, at least three of them were statistically significantly, that is, it was proven to be reduced, uh, and also we think this one is reduced. So. Um, this, this gene controls an important pathway in, in the cell. Uh, and seven years ago, we made this hypothesis that fat would be involved in the RPLA, and also by other reasons that I, I'm not showing here, is that we made the hypothesis that mutations in fat may be involved in human neurodegenerative disease and possibly ataxias because they're very expressed in the cerebellum, these genes. So at this conference, seven years after, 
I've met this young Dutch uh, group leader, Dineke, who spoke at the first uh, day of the conference, of the scientific conferences. And what she described was uh, a court of 20 uh, patients from the Netherlands, and <coughs> two of them, uh, and, and at least some of these patients, had mutations in FAT2 and in FAT1. So seven years after, we were able to sort of start to begin validating our hypothesis that these genes will be involved in uh, ataxias. And we think that's only the beginning. We can uh, reasonably think that other genes and molecules that make this pathway will be involved uh, as well. Um, so I told you that we're using uh, flies and then we, we moved into mice to confirm our findings. And this possibly has now some um, significance for humans, but we are also trying to uh, learn from mice and then uh, something that we wouldn't be able to model in flies. As I told you, you need the young engineers need to use many uh, models before it actually can get to the Formula One car. And what this model, the mouse model, um, allows us to do is to understand what's going wrong in the specific brain areas that are most affected in DRPLA. Uh, DRPLA stands for dentato rubro pallido lucian atrophy. Now, dentato is for the dentate nucleus, uh, which is here. And rubro stands for the nucleus ruber, or red nucleus, which is here. Um, and um, effectively, uh, all these uh, nuclei are well represented in, from the human brain, are well represented in the mouse brain. So now, we can use this model to hammer in these nuclei and try and find out what's wrong in particular with this nuclei. We know that all cells will have this autophagy, this rubbish recycling process wrong, but these may have something else. And this is what we found out, that there, are, there is a, a particular molecule that's involved in uh, the metabolism of RNA. So uh, in basic biology, our genes, which is DNA, make this messenger that's called RNA which makes then the protein. Now, this messenger also has to be regulated, and uh, this uh, gene, this, this molecule that is usually found in the nucleus, that is where the genes are transformed in RNA, um, is actually lost in the RPLA, and it's lost only in the dentate nucleus and in the red nucleus. It goes outside of the nucleus. It goes in the surrounding part of the cell that is uh, outside. So we think this is defective. So we still, we we're very keen to study what is, this, what is the impact of this. And uh, we suspect that we may be on the right track because from the uh, literature, we know that they regulate the messengers, the RNA, for FAT1, FAT2, and FAT3. And uh, that also they physically bind the protein that's mutated in uh, DRPLA, and also the protein that is mutated in, ataxia, in, in spinal cerebellar ataxia 1 and spinal cerebellar ataxia 2. So perhaps these are also other determinants. And if uh, the results come out the way we are hypothesizing this way, we also think that the, uh, the, these molecules, RB Fox 1, 2, and 3, may be interesting genes for uh, ataxias. Um, so, this was one part of the story. So I told you how we're learning from uh, these this models to uh, what's going wrong inside the cells, inside the single, our single nerve cells. But the nervous is a system. It's not made just of nerve cells. You have other cells that help the nerve cells to work. And these cells are called glia. Now, uh, what happened when we studied the DRPLA flies? We realized that these other cells were really, really important. They're important in many neurodegenerative diseases, but in DRPLA, in our model flies, seem to be more important than, for instance, in model flies for Huntington disease. Uh, and uh, if we had problems in this self-digestion, in this rubbish recycling mechanism inside the, the glial cells in particular, uh, the flies would die very, very quickly. So we th thought, that, well, that, that possibly what is happening is that the nerve cells are getting damaged by these other cells, not performing their function. Uh, and uh, just again to make the point that this is conserved between models, we know that there is 
uh, suffering of, of the glial cells also in the mouse model. And uh, they look like they are uh, also stressed by events uh, that you know, are, are taking place in these brains and we're trying to figure out what they are. So what we decided to do um, was, I mean, our hypothesis is that then the neurons, that is the nerve cells, they react to these damaged accessory cells that are clear. Uh, it's not accessory, it's supporting cells that are clear. And we can probably identify the genes that are involved in this reaction um, by doing uh, what is called a, a genetic screen. That is, we unbiasedly mutate a lot of genes in uh, the fly and we try and figure out which mutants then would prolong the life of these flies. Um, and we came out with a number of uh, candidate genes that were prolonging the life of these flies and that are possibly helpful for DRPLA. And we decided to focus on two. Um, for two simple reasons, I'm not going into the detail again of what these genes are, but these two molecules are uh, on the surface of the cells. And we think that that could be uh, more accessible, for instance, to target uh, in the future. And also, these particular genes have similar genes in humans. We all have them. Uh, and always, because you need more model, we made sure that these uh, well, we, we also concentrated on these two genes because there are mouse models uh, or you know, there are mice that can be made mutant for these genes so that we can then verify that what we find in the flies is also present in the mice. Um, and so th this is the, uh, an ongoing project and of course we're still studying these genes, but I wanted to conclude by essentially giving you the perspective uh, I mean, the, the, the statement of what we found and then the perspective. So from this integrated approach of um, uh, Drosophila is the fruit fly, uh, is the scientific name for the fruit fly and the mouse, we've learned th three things on the RPLA. Well, the first thing is that the nerve cells degenerate because of this alteration in the autophagy or in the uh, rubbish recycling mechanism that our cells have, and possibly through the downregulation of the fat and these other pathway that is important for the cell. We also think that the areas that are most severely affected, that is the dented nucleus and the red nucleus in the RPLA, display additional problems uh, that are possibly due to the localization of this RNA regulating uh, factor which may be responsible for why these nuclei in particular are so dramatically affected in the RPLA. And the third thing is that the, these supporting cells, glial cells, really play a critical role in, in the RPLA pathophysiology, in, 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 the, in, in the, the, the disease. So these things are things that we've learned from our labs, but they help us design potential avenues for trying then intervene. Because then if we want to uh, develop uh, an approach to uh, that uh, ameliorates the RPLA, well, the first thing that we should take care of is this making this, this recycling working. And we try also to, because the RPLA is a very rare attack, it, it, we, we know of about 50 patients that are affected in the UK at the moment through collaborations with the clinicians. But it shares very similar characteristics with other disease. And in the rare disease field, we really need this cross-contamination, this understanding of the different conditions and of the processes that are disrupted in the different conditions so that one thing, one disease can help another. So for instance, we think that DRPLA shares a number of things with uh, a number of characteristics with this class of disease that's called lysosomal storage disorders. Um, so we think that uh, anything that is also planned and developed for lysosomal storage disorder would be beneficial for the RPLA. The other thing that we need to do is to target this brain nucleus. We need to protect this specifically. And we could do that by perhaps having, again, a specific targeted approach. This, this, this protein that I've described, RB Fox, could be a good target, but also at the same time, because we know that this protein is regulated and regulates uh, the excitability of the neurons, perhaps having a non-specific approach to modulate the excitability of these neurons could work the same, bypassing the genetic cause, could at least help. Uh, and the third thing, again, 
uh, we not only act, have to act on the nerve cells, but we have to act on the supporting cells because these will be critical uh, in time. And the way we think that that may happen is either by supporting the supporting cells themselves or perhaps by making the neurons a little, the nerve cells a little bit more resistant to having a damaged supporting cell. For instance, by acting directly on these uh, ec the, the, these proteins that are on the membranes that uh, probably mediate the uh, adhesion, the, 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 the sticking together of the nerve cells with the supporting cells. So again, as I said, these are ideas that we're trying to develop. First of all, that, that come out of our basic understanding of how the disease works uh, in, in, uh, in these models. And uh, really, in all these efforts, uh, you know, I, I take the least credit because um, uh, we've been very lucky to be supported by Ataxia UK. The work on uh, glia is made by David, who is the PhD student who is supported by Ataxia UK, and uh, the inventor of the De Chavot model uh, as, a, as a way of learning uh, for the Formula One. And uh, uh, Olga is a postdoc that's supported by a different charity. It's the Henry Smith charity, but she did all the work on mice to um, not only confirm what we found in flies, but she was the person who came up with the idea of looking specifically what was wrong in the, uh, in the nuclei that are um, affected in nerve cells. Um, and uh, because they're not in the room, I can tell you that really. They're really the best PhD students and the best postdoc I've ever had. So uh, really, they, they, they should take a lot of credit for that. And I should thank collaborators and also other sources of funding. Thanks.